So in the crypto space, this has been the biggest piece of legislation uh, that is affecting uh, crypto exchanges, DeFi, taxpayers, uh, and, and every stakeholder in the chain. When you sign up for your next like, you know, Web3 wallet or when you transact in a DEX, you yeah. will have to give your KYC information to, to that DEX and the DEX will have to kind of track your capital gains and capital losses and report that information to the IRS. So everybody, let's talk about your favorite subject, taxes. I know you are dying to talk about this. I'm dying to talk about it myself. Unfortunately, I don't know enough to really give you the full rundown of uh, these new rules and regulations for the IRS. But thankfully, I know somebody who is. And uh, this would be Sheehan, Chandra Zakara. Sheehan, you've been on the show, I want to say, three or four times now. So welcome back to the show to uh, keep us up to date about what the heck is going on for taxes. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Uh, good to be here. Yeah. So when you reached out, you're like, there's this new, there's this new regulations coming in and they're, and they're, and they're asking for input and it's going to really affect everybody. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll get to it at some point. But unfortunately, uh, as I've come to find out that if I don't take action now, things are going on the tubes quickly. So uh, you just shared this with me. And I know it's like a 300 page document, the gross pro proceeds and basis reporting by brokers and determination of amount realized and basis for digital asset transactions. And the comments so far, and the IRS puts things out about, you know, they want comments, people to, to get in, 124,950. So, and this is from comments from like blockchain organizations, you've got Kraken, you've got Coinbase and a bunch of different people that were making comments. What is going on with this and why is this so important of what's happening? Yeah, so there's there's a lot to cover. Uh, maybe let me give you kind of like the very simple version of what's happening. So, Thank you. so in the crypto space, this has been the biggest piece of legislation uh, that is affecting uh, crypto exchanges, DeFi, taxpayers, uh, and and every stakeholder in the chain. So basically, as a result of these regulations, uh, crypto exchanges, you know, CFI exchanges, you know, certain wallet providers and DEXs they are forced to act very similar to stockbrokers uh, like, you know, Robin Hoods of the world and et cetera. So what do I mean by that? That means if these proposed regulations get finalized as it is, when you sign up for your next, like, you know, Web3 wallet or when you transact in a DEX, you yeah. will have to give your KYC information to, to that DEX and the DEX will have to kind of track your capital gains and capital losses and report that information to the IRS and send you a tax form at the end of the year. So effectively, you know, this is kind of, uh, you know, the, the, the pressure on the government uh, kind of forcing centralization into, into DeFi uh, as a result of this regulation. So that, that is why it's very, very important. Mm -hmm. So how is this going to work? I mean, I mean, you just said that everything's going to, have to be KYC and, and, and AML'd for on the, on these DEXs. So, how are they proposing to do this to make a really essentially a decentralized aspect to now just condense everything down to centralized? Yeah. So, in the the regulation, I think uh, the main thing is that they are defining a broker, and if you consider to be a broker, you had to kind of go through this, uh, you know, compliance requirement. So, maybe let me kind of share the five types of brokers according to the Treasury. Uh, so number one, uh, digital asset platforms. So these include centralized exchanges, DEXs, and, and even like crypto ATMs. Okay. Uh, number two, digital asset hosted wallet providers. Uh, so I don't want to mention any names, uh, but but you know your favorite Web3 wallets and et cetera. Sure. So those will be created, treated as a broker. Uh, number three is interesting. So digital asset payment processes, they will be treated as brokers as well. So these are the, the platforms that kind of uh, allow you to kind of uh, like if you're like a merchant, instead of accepting crypto directly, you, you know, hook up your system to a payment processor. So you get paid in USD. Uh, number four, uh, they call these other brokers like in a certain stable coin issuers. And if you're doing like an ICO, like they will have to kind of go to this KYC and reporting requirements. Okay. Uh, yeah. And then number five is like real estate person somewhat rare like if you're selling real estate and if you're accepting crypto in exchange uh, in, 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 in instead of like cash then you will have to do some reporting requirement so the, the point is that uh again those are the five categories uh, so according to the treasury and the irs if you're allowing somebody to trade crypto in return for cash or, or any type of uh, any type of compensation 
and you're in the position to know the identity of that person, you will be treated as a broker. So that's how broadly that they define the term, uh, the broker. Wow. So, I mean, you just talked about the one thing that, that uh, you said was the wallets. So, you know, you said your favorite Web3 wallet, whatever you want to say that is. So let's say, so all those Web3 wallets, and there's a, there's, there's a plethora of different wallets that are out there. Are you telling me that they're always, they're, all of them are going to have to register the individuals who download the wallet and say, okay, this is, this is Sheehan's wallet, and he, this is all his information tied to the wallet, and we haven't registered, and we're going to do KYC and AML just for the wallets? So there's a, there's a little exception to the wallet. So there, there are certain wallets that only allow you to hold the private keys, right? So those wallets are not considered brokers because it does not allow you to trade. However, there are a lot of wallets that have this kind of like swap feature. It allows you to kind of go from one coin to another directly through the wallet. So right. those could be treated as a broker. So in that case, if they want to operate in the US and serve US users without getting PNLS from the IRS, um, yes, like, you know, whenever I do that trade, like before I do the trade, I will have to give my KYC information to the wallet and, and the wallet has to approve me as like a KYC user um to to be compliant with these new new rules i got you so like like that i've seen that service in my ledger i've seen that in elipal i've seen that in tangem where you know it's a cold storage wallet it's self custody uh and but you hold your own private keys so on that regard it's okay but there are options to do swaps and if that's the case and they want everything to to, to go about First of all, how is that? How, I, I got to ask, like, how is this even possible to, to actually get this done? And I guess that is the whole point of them asking for like for like feedback. So what have you seen as far as like feedback for people to say, yeah, this isn't going to work or or yeah. Could work? Yeah, it's a good question. So as as soon as these proposed regulations came out, uh, I personally spoke to like almost like all the big players in the industry, like the Web3 wallets and exchanges and et cetera. Uh, the, the, the reality is that if you have a Web3 wallet software, you are in a position to put like a window asking for the KYC information. Like it is possible. I mean, think about it, right? I mean, your Web3 wallet, they get updates like, I don't know, every month or something like that. So one of those updates could be like, you know, asking your name, address and et cetera. So the wallet providers can technically collect the KYC and, and, and kind of comply with the rules. But the problem is, um, how is that going to affect their business model, right? Because all these wallets are based on the premise that, you know, you, you self-custody things, you know. Um, uh, the wallets don't want to uh, collect the KYC information because they want people to transact anonymously. So um, right. so to answer your question, it is possible, but then, then it becomes like a business decision that they need to make. So, yeah, so I, I could definitely see that. So I know, like, I, uh, I took a peek uh, just to see, like, uh, you know, what uh, what your response would be, and of course, yes, here you are uh, for Coin Tracker, and you and you laid it all out uh, uh, pretty well, I suppose, uh, for what's happening. So, if you could just just summarize, like, like what what were you saying here as far as like this will or won't work, and how is this going to work? Yeah, so uh, like th there are like a lot of like transaction aggregators like Coin Tracker in the in the space today, right? So. Uh, obviously, we won't be brokers and we did not have any like, you know, comments on, you know, who should be a broker and who should not be a broker. Yeah. However, we are very concerned about some of the data gaps that this new 1099 DA regime is going to create. Like, for example, let's say I have one Bitcoin in my, my ledger or, or, or MetaMask uh, wallet and I send that to Coinbase and sell it there. So in that case, Coinbase will issue me like a 1099 DA with only just sales number. And the cost basis will be missing. So, uh, so now this problem is going to get amplified because Coinbase has to report. I mean, they have already already been reporting because they're expected to be report, reporting these things because they're centralized exchanges. But if I do that same thing for Meta, uh, like any other wallet that could be treated as a broker, they will have to do the reporting as well. So there will be a lot of ampli amplified data gaps. Um, and now these data caps, I think what's different here is that now these like incomplete data, these brokers going to report that to the IRS and could be like triggering the IRS system erroneously. Um, mm -hmm. and, and you could get notices as a result of that. So as a matter of fact, the IRS is expecting in the first year, 8 billion 1099 DA forms 
filed by these brokers. So imagine like the volume of like incomplete and mostly inaccurate data Iris has to kind of pass through and and kind of like you know take action. So so we are very concerned about those data gaps that's going to get created as a result. Uh, because whenever you touch a non-broker type of location, Rob, you mentioned about the, the, the wallets that do not offer the swap feature or like self-custody type of situation, right. your cost rates is going to get lost. And the 1099DA, the tax form you're going to get at the end of the year will be in an incomplete and inaccurate. But most importantly, because of the regs, those incomplete and inaccurate data now gets reported to the IRS, which is bad. Yeah, that's no, no. That, that's 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 extremely bad. And I, I take a look at all this this um, this data that that's that's uh, being thrown around. And of course, the problem with these with these with these three letter agencies, whether it be the CFT, well, uh, CFTC is four actually, SEC or the, or the IRS, is that they're giving us some type of regulations because they're trying to to, to muddle the, their way through. And we don't get all the information, just like with uh, the SEC, which is why they're suing Kraken and why they're suing uh, Coinbase and why uh, just today uh, CZ Binance stepped down for AML uh, violations. So like all these things that are that are happening, it makes me concerned because there's no clear guidance of actually what to do. And actually, if you think about it, even, even moving forward as far as like who's a broker dealer, like we run a... a, a a stake pool. We're stake pool operators for Cardano, and since since we give out uh, these rewards, which would be the staking rewards for people who stake their Cardano with us, now I started thinking to myself: Am I going to have to, you know, KYC and AML every single person that actually comes into uh, our stake pool so I can give them a? I mean, if they're in America, a 1099. Is that how it's going to work, or how's so that? So there's good news for you. So uh, I, I don't know what constitutes a broker dealer under the FINRA rule, but uh, under the IRS rule, uh, if you're solely running a proof of stake or proof of working validation type of service, you are not considered to be a broker, ah, so, which is good uh, because that's how all these blockchain kind of get initiated, right? That's how the new blocks are created. So at least they thought about that and, and they're excluding that initiation point from, from broker reporting requirements, uh, which is good. Uh, there's another exclusion. And if you're a merchant and you accept you know, crypto directly in exchange for goods or services, you're not considered to be a broker. So that is also good because that could, I don't know, open up crypto to be used as a medium of exchange you know, sometime in the future. Yeah, I gotcha. All right. Well, that's, uh, that's, that's one good piece of, of information in a uh, and a monstrous uh, landslide of, of negativity. So, Shiana, thank you for, for kind of m making things clear. Hey, and uh, so I'm going to link the, uh, the uh, regulations uh, uh, link in the description below so you guys can check it out and take a look at what actually people are proposing. And these are like big names in, in the space, of course. But, Shiana, while I got you here, I'm just going to ask you some like different questions that, that people have been throwing at me. Sure. Which are the first one, I think is a pretty good one, which is uh, with all the different uh, crypto uh, centralized exchanges that have collapsed or are collapsing, how are we able to actually take any kind of losses on our taxes if we can actually do that? Let's say tomorrow, Binance shuts down. I'm not sh throwing FUD, I'm just saying, what if? What if it does shut down? How would that work for like going, hey, I just lost my life savings or hey, I just lost a hundred bucks? Yeah, good questions. We actually wrote like a very in-depth article about this. Um, actually, Rob, I'll, I'll uh, link that to you here. Perfect. Um, because uh, the, the, uh, I'll give the TLDR. The, the TLDR is it depends on the each case uh, of, of that exchange because certain exchanges could go under because of, you know, just bad, you know, business decisions. Or, yeah. you know, in, in some cases they could have like, you know, theft or, you know, that type of losses. So it really depends on the, the nature of the loss. So that's number one. And, and number two, until you're 100% sure that, you know, you have no uh, opportunity to kind of recover the funds, you yeah. cannot take that deduction. So in most, yeah. like the cases that we are hearing, like all these like, you know, cases in the bankruptcies and all those things, these are kind of like ongoing. So until those things are finalized, you cannot even think about taking the deductions. You know, that, that, that's how the tax, tax, tax law, law works. Uh, the, the other possibility that I want you to think, and I actually experienced this, I had, you know, a few hundred dollars, um, you know, stack on um, uh, the BlockFi. Yeah. But after like a year or so, I was able to get everything back. So mm -hmm. I thought I had a loss, but 
I got everything back. So it is also possible that you could get some of this money back uh, depending on your situation. So all these factors kind of go into the picture to see if you can take a deduction or not. And, and lastly, there could be situations where you, you can get a deduction, but if you don't, do not itemize on your tax return, you're not getting any benefit out of that. So there's like so many questions you need to go to to see if it really makes sense for you to, to deduct it or if, you're, if, if you can actually take a benefit out of that deduction. Perfect. So that would, like, well, here's a point for everybody. If, uh, if deductions scare you and you're like, I don't know about that, just go to your CPA. And hopefully they have some, they are a little well-versed into crypto or digital assets. Good luck. But if not, uh, I will give you a link to, uh, to Sheehan. Maybe, maybe, I don't even know Sheehan if you do that anymore. I, I don't think, I think you work for CoinTracker uh, exclusively and that's it. <laughs> I, I don't practice anymore. Uh, however, like, you know, we have a network of CPAs. So if you, if you have, if you need, if you're looking for a CPA, I'm happy to introduce you to a capable one. Perfect. And then also uh, last question, which is this Christmas is coming up. So of course, a lot of people are looking to, to gift some things. And uh, there's no better gift, in my personal opinion, than just a little crypto under the, under the Christmas tree. The question is this, how much can we gift our immediate family members? And is that uh, a taxable event? If I have, let's just say I'm going to give, I don't know, uh, 30 Pepe coin to my wife, which would be a really crappy gift. But let's just say I do that. And uh, what is, is that a taxable event as I move things and then it goes into her? Or does she have to pay the taxes when she actually spends it or whatnot? Yeah, so gifting under the U.S. tax law is not generally taxable. So uh, in 2023, I just looked at the limit. So you can give up to $17,000 worth of coins or anything uh, to unlimited number of people. No kidding. So, yeah, so I can give 15000 to my kid number one. 15,000 to my kid number two or, or, or another 16,000 to, to some, some relative. Right. Uh, well, that's pretty, yeah. so like I could give, so let's say I got 10 kids, every kid gets yeah. 10,000, 10, yeah. and then that's, that's fine. Up to 7,000. So just to be clear, like you can give like more than $17,000, but if you do that, you had to file like a tax form. Uh, mm -hmm. just to kind of notify the IRS, hey, I did uh, gift this much, but there's no taxes involved, but you just had to notify the IRS it was more than $17,000. And then when they, let's say that I give everybody a big, let's just, well, let's just say I give everybody a quarter of a Bitcoin and then uh, they go out and they take that quarter of Bitcoin and then they buy, I don't know, the, the, the worst type of Lambo you can think of. So <laughs> is there a taxable event there when they actually spend it or no? Because it's a, it's a gift. Yeah. So, so generally speaking, like, you know, you want to give appreciated assets to people like, you know, meaning like, you know, in your case, sure. let's say you bought a Bitcoin for thousand dollars, you gifted it to somebody when it's worth, let's say $30,000. So in that case, the, the, the recipient of the gift gets your carryover base, basis, which is, you know, thousand dollars. So yeah. um, if he spends, uh, if, if, if he sells the, the Bitcoin at 30000 then you would have a $29,000 gain, uh, or depending on the sales price. So that, that's how it would work. Ah, okay. I thought I found a loophole. Damn it. All right. <laughs> well, Sheehan, again, thanks for, for stopping by on the show. Everybody, if you're looking, to, again, for that, for that network, I'll put a link in the description, also for the regulations right there. And that will conclude it for this piece. Sheehan, be, before we take off, though, you've been in the, in, in the uh, crypto game for quite some time. Any words of wisdom for the... Uh, weary investors out there. So going back to the gift example, uh, Rob, the, the, the loophole is this. So in oh. in, in, <laughs> in in my example, uh, you, your kid could be subject to a lower tax rate on that $29,000 gain versus you. So so that is the advantage. Ah, uh, that's true. Because if yeah. like, let's say that she, you know, Sheehan is a multi multi-millionaire yeah. and he gives it to his kid and his kid only makes 29,000. Well, <laughs> exactly. Gotcha. Yeah. Excellent. Well, that's good to know. That is the greatest advice we can do. All right, everybody. So uh, again, Shigan, thanks for stopping by. Everybody, if you uh, like today's video, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing. Everything we talk about is time sensitive. That's it for today. Thank you so much, Shigan. And of course, we will see you guys in the next one. Thank you.